Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Non-QM for High Net Worth Borrowers. Uh, before we introduce our speaker, I want to let you know throughout the presentation, when you have questions, go ahead and use the little questions tab because we're going to be collecting those questions and reviewing them throughout the presentation. And at the end of the Q&A, um, we're going to go and answer as many as we can. So throughout the presentation, just as questions arrive, use the little questions tab and we'll get to as many as we can. Today's speaker is Mr. Todd Harris, National Sales Manager for Lencher. Take it away, Todd. Thank you, Rose. And Thank you everyone for joining the webinar. My name is Todd Harris. I am the National Sales Manager here. And as we get started with this, I want to tell you a little bit about Lensure. We're located in San Diego. That's where we're headquartered at. We are founded in 2015. We've got regional centers in Ohio, Rhode Island, and also Georgia, in addition to California. We do our docs and funding and underwriting out of San Diego and then also out of Atlanta, Georgia. We've been securitizing loans annually since 2017. We've got an experienced management team, which for those of you that did loans back in the day, uh, most of the executives here are from accredited home lenders. And so we're growing. We're in 35 states currently. We're looking to be in all 50 states and hopefully we'll be there sooner than later. I wanna talk a little bit about our agenda today. We're gonna to talk about opportunities to grow your business in the non-QM space. We're gonna talk about some niche mortgage programs that uh, hopefully will help you do that. We wanna talk about some competitive loan pricing options, and then we'll have some questions and answers at the end. I get the question all the time, what is non-QM? What does that mean? A lot of people define it as just missed agency. Other people will say, oh, they, they allow higher debt ratios, they do mortgage delinquency, they handle non-warrantable condos allow for multiple income sources, things like that. I try to not, I don't like to be boxed in on an answer to that question. So the first bullet point there is where I like to describe it. I say Lensure focuses on making good loans, which may or may not qualify for conforming. I don't know what qualifies for conforming in this day and age. I mean, it seems to change from time to time. So we just focus on making good loans. And those include bank statement loans. We have an asset depletion and qualifier program. We do DSCR loans. We have investment properties. We're looking to serve the A paper market, the market that you're already in, the borrowers that you're already marketing to. So I'm not asking you to go out and change your marketing plan. I just want you to take a look at those borrowers a little closer the next time you run into a little kink here or there with some of those borrowers. Our average FICO is over 700, and our average LTV is below 70%. We do lots of different loans, like ITIN loans and foreign nationals, the DSCR that I mentioned above. Some things we don't do, we don't do Fannie Freddie, the FHA stuff, foreclosure bust outs, and second mortgages. So with that said, let's just jump into the first market opportunity that this is for self-employed borrowers. Self-employed borrowers, is an important segment because as you get into the higher end homes across America, a lot of those higher end communities are being purchased by self-employed borrowers. So this chart right here is very interesting and I want you to zero in on it. It basically says that between 2017 and 2020, the self-employment workforce is gonna add about 27 million people. And by the end of 2020, they're predicting that we're going to be roughly 42 million in self-employed workers. The reason this is such an amazing statistic is that that means by the end of 2020, roughly 33% of the workforce is going to be considered self-employed. Those are doctors, attorneys, consultants, real estate professionals, entrepreneurs, small business owners, the gig economy. A lot of things are leading us towards this 33% self-employment statistic. So how do we find some of these self-employed borrowers? There's a lot of different ways for you guys to go about finding those people. A lot of people use neighborhood mailers. I personally like Yelp and Zillow and LinkedIn. Those are places where you can certainly find groups of self-employed people to go market towards. 
I want to talk about a real example of a loan, just give you some specifics. Here's a loan where the borrower is self-employed as a consultant. They wanted to purchase a $920,000 house. They had a 772 FICO, and they were looking for 80% LTV, and they had six months reserves. So some of you guys are thinking, why in the world is this loan at Lensure? And that would be a good question. So if we go to the next step here, this borrower was a W-2 employee in 2017 and 18, but about 15 months ago, they opened up their own business. Now, because they opened up their own business 15 months ago, they couldn't provide any tax returns yet. So we asked for 12 months of bank statements. We got them, we reviewed them, and we liked what they showed. So because of all those factors on the left-hand side that we previously talked about, we went ahead and booked this loan. We closed it. Here's another loan. This particular person was an orthopedic surgeon, or is an orthopedic surgeon. I mean, had been for three years. Their FICA was 784, and their W-2 from 2018 shows $692,000. They want 80% LTV, and they're looking to purchase a $3.1 million property in Los Angeles. So again, some of you are looking at those statistics, and you're saying, well, why is this loan over at Lensure? I'll tell you that, too. This particular orthopedic surgeon was so good that he became a partner at the medical group, and he did that about two months ago. So Fannie Freddie, they came in and said, whoa, high risk. We don't like this one. He's self-employed. That's ridiculous, right? I mean, all of us look at this. This guy got promoted, and he's, we've got an employment contract now. It's spelled out in that contract that they estimate his income to be $1 million in 2019. So we took all of that, we took the 2017, the 2018 W-2, and the new employment contract, and we used all of that for income, and we closed this loan. And not only did we close the loan, we would say, please give us 10 more just like it, because we love these loans, we think they're good risk, and we're not concerned the way that Fannie and Freddie would be. So a little bit more about our bank statement program. I just want to focus on the first bullet points, the upfront evaluation of income. You don't have to submit a full file. So when you have bank statements, in a lot of cases, you wonder what income the lender is going to use. Well, we look at that upfront and we give you a quick answer, and we do that within 24 to 48 hours of you providing us with the income. And that's very important, especially as you're trying to go after a more purchase business. You can't be waiting forever to find out what your income is and expect to make a competitive offer. So we do that, and, and that's, we feel, a competitive advantage with our bank statement program. I'm going to jump across here to a comparison between Lensure and some of the other lenders. We allow multiple bank statements. Most other lenders don't. We don't ask for a P&L. A lot of other lenders do. On minimum business expense ratios, we go as low as 10%. Most other lenders are at 35%. We'll go to 90% on business bank statements. Some other non-QM lenders will go to 90%, but they want that to be personal, or personal bank statements. We don't require the person to be an owner at 100% of the business. He doesn't have to own all of it. He can have partners. Other non-QM lenders, they want, you know, they want the person to be the sole owner of the company. We allow non-sufficient funds and overdrafts. You know, we look at them. We don't say we're going to do it all the time, but we recognize that issues come up, and so we're flexible on that. So let's talk about our next one, which is property investors. This is also another segment that's growing significantly and has a lot of potential. There's a number of different reasons this market's growing, so I'll give you four bullet points that I'd like to speak to, and the first is the buyer market's pretty young. A lot of them can't get financing. The second one is there's just not a lot of inventory out there. We all know that. The third one is millennials tend to be very career-minded, and in many cases, you know, they're going to be promoted or they want to be promoted, so they're not looking to get tied down to a house that they got to sell if that promotion does come. And then the fourth one is that some of those millennials just watch too much TV and read too much, 
they think there's a recession around every corner and they just don't want to be tied into a house. They make good renters, but they just don't want to be tied to a house. And because they make good renters, that's a great opportunity for property investors. And that's why this market's taking off. This slide talks about one statement there that I'd like you to zero in on, which is property investors usually don't stock with just one property. So it's a great opportunity for you to work with some investors and as they build their portfolio, you can continue to do more and more loans. It's a great way for you to be a business partner with them. The question comes up quite often, how do we find prospects? So here's one example where we just jumped into Facebook and typed in Miami-Dade property investors and then we clicked on groups and when we did that, all these different investment groups popped up. Now, as nice as that is, what's even more important is all these investors in these investment groups, they're looking for financing. They need to be able to get these properties financed. And that's where you and that's where us, we come into the equation. So let's talk about the way that we calculate our rental income. And this is important because we do this very differently than anyone else. Fannie Mae, they take the negative cash flow and they add it, or they subtract it from the, or excuse me, they take the negative cash flow to the monthly debt calculation, and this results in a higher DTI. At Lensher, we use the negative cash flow to offset the total income, so we subtract it from the total income. This results in a lower DTI and better rates. So let me give you an example of this. This is a real loan. Roger and Stacy, we have their income here. Roger's $6,531, Stacy's $6,006. And so you can see on the Fannie Mae side, they add that up and they come to $12,537. On our side, we look at it and we say, okay, Roger and Stacy, they have currently owned some rental properties and using the Schedule E method, they come up with a loss of $2,348. They also, on the property they're looking to purchase, we use the net rental method, which is gross rents times 75%, and the property they're looking to purchase shows a loss of $1,196. So we add those two together and subtract it from their income, which gives us a total income of $8,992. So if we carry that over to the top page here on this slide, it's, you can see the Fannie Mae calculation has 12537 the lens share income we're using is 8,992. So now we got to add in the debt. So they've got a mortgage payment of $2,287. They've got some credit cards and an auto loan, which add up to $617. But Fannie, they haven't subtracted out those losses yet. So now we insert those two losses right at this stage, the 2348 and the 1196. We add all of that together and it comes to $6,448. And Fannie and Freddie, they pull the brake real quick and they say, no, nope, we got a DTI issue. Can't do this loan. 51.4 is what this adds up to. You jump over to our side, we just add up the credit cards, the auto loan, and the mortgage payment. And that comes to $2,904. We divide that by $8,992. We come up with a DTI of 32.3. We book this loan and we love it. And once again, we ask you for 10 more because we think this is a common sense way of approaching the income. Now it's important to be able to get the income to full dock. And the reason is, is as this slide shows, full dock has lower interest rates. Now we could probably do some of these loans on bank statements, but if you do bank statements, that results in a higher interest rate. You keep coming across maybe a DSCR, interest rates a little bit higher on that. And then you go all the way across the foreign national, those have the highest interest rates. So it behooves you and it behooves us to be able to try and get as many properties as possible to qualify as full dock. And that's why we take the common sense, common sense approach to the rental income. So let's talk about a real loan. This was a real transaction that we closed. We had a property investor. He wanted to buy another rental property. One of our competitors had it and they were calculating the income the Fannie Mae way that we just reviewed. 
and that resulted in a DTI that was too high. The deal stalled out, and before you know it, the loan officer was the one left holding the bag, and the real estate agent was pretty upset. So now enter Lensure. We came in, we restructured it, we calculated the income the way that we just reviewed. It worked just fine. We closed the loan within 13 days, and the loan officer missed the close of escrow by only five days. So instead of being a goat, the loan officer was now a hero with that real estate agent. So a little bit more about our investment property loans. We don't limit the number of properties a borrower can finance. You know, a borrower can have 50 properties and financing on all 50 of them. That, that's fine with us. What we do limit, we just don't want more than 10 loans from any one investor. We have DTIs up to 50%. We, we go with non-warrantable condos. We're also good with condo tells. We have a rate buy down feature that's aggressive. It allows our rates to stay low. We do a DSCR program. We also have bank statement programs as well. So let's talk about now the foreign nationals. This is another market that's been emerging and has a lot of potential. This slide here is very interesting. Most people would not think that foreign nationals are averaging more per house than the U.S. citizens are, but it is about 17% higher. Another statistic that's very interesting is in 2015, the Asia Pacific region surpassed North America as the wealthiest region in the world. So there's a lot of money out there that's looking for a home and a good solid place to make an investment. This slide's kind of busy, so I just want to focus on the first and last bullet point. The first bullet point says in 2018, foreign nationals spent $121 billion on a little over a quarter million properties. That's a lot of properties being bought by foreign nationals. The last bullet point is interesting as well. It shows Florida, California, and Texas with 42% of the business. So these purchases are happening in most, you know, just in these three states. And so if you're looking to kind of look, get into this market, I would focus on those three states. A lot of people talk about, well, how do I get started? How do I find prospects if I want to jump into this foreign national arena? It's not as hard as you might think. If you start looking at real estate advertisements, you start zeroing in on advertisements in a different language. A lot of these people speak multiple languages, so you're not stuck with just whatever language it's in. You can network with immigration and tax attorneys. Those are some other good ideas. So there's a lot of ways to get started. Don't be intimidated by the fact that uh, a lot of them speak foreign languages. It's important to understand the residency. Here at Lensure, we do four different types of transactions. We do permanent resident aliens. We do non-permanent resident aliens. Of course, we do our foreign nationals, and we also do ITIN borrowers. The main difference between the foreign national borrower and the other three is that the foreign national borrower does not live in the United States. The other three do. So let's talk about a couple real-life loan examples again. This person was a B, B1, B2 visa, foreign national. They, did, they wanted to refinance cash out of an investment property. They wanted 50% LTV, and it was a beautiful waterfront property in, Port, or in Florida. They had purchased it in April of 2018 for $2.8 million. The issue is, or one of the issues, is they didn't have any reserves. It's funny, they had all this cash to buy this property just a year and a half ago, and now they don't have any reserves. So we talked with the loan officer, dug in a little bit checked out the loan a little more. We got comfortable with it and we decided to make the loan. So we gave them 1.4 million and we used that 1.4 million for our cash reserves. Here's another one. There's another foreign national B1, B2 visa. They didn't have a FICO score or social security number. That's pretty common. They wanted to purchase a $600,000 investment property and they wanted to do it at 70% LTV. They had enough money for the down payment and closing costs, but they didn't have enough to meet the reserve requirements. 
Or you could look at that another way and say they had enough money for the reserve requirements, but then they didn't have enough for the cash down payment or closing costs. Either way, they're short some cash. So again, we dug into this file, we looked at it, and we said, all right, we'll do this. We recognize there's a little more risk, so we added a quarter to the rate, and we closed the transaction. So we like to think we're pretty aggressive and try to find some common sense ways of making these loans. A little bit more about our foreign national program, we go up to 75% LTV. We accept income verification letters from countries without tax returns. We accept foreign credit reports and credit reference letters. The foreign assets can be used for the reserve requirements. So let's move on and talk about another market opportunity, which I see is a huge opportunity for a lot of people. We call this the asset rich income challenged opportunity. So when I say that, what I'm really speaking to is we have an asset depletion and an asset qualifier program at Lensure. It allows borrowers who have lots of assets but are experiencing some struggles with their income to still qualify for a loan. A lot of these people kind of fall in some different buckets that their income is just choppy and inconsistent. They may be semi-retired or maybe they're completely retired. There's some gaps in their employment. Maybe they're entrepreneurs and they are kind of all over the map with their income. You know, sometimes they get a large commission one month and then they go five, six, seven months with nothing coming in. So a lot of people get challenged with those types of borrowers. So for us, we try to put them over into our asset depletion or asset qualifier program. And unlike the standard asset depletion programs that you may have heard about or floating around out there, we qualify the assets and then divide it by 120 or 60 months. This results in a much higher monthly income calculation. And we qualify the income by using 100% of the cash and cash equivalents, 80% of stocks and bonds, and 70% of the retirement accounts. So again, real life example of a loan. We closed this one just a couple months ago. Bill's a partner at an investment firm and his wife, Dana, she's a physician. They own a home in San Francisco, and it was valued at $6.25 million. Bill had a 752 credit score, and Dana had a 760 credit score. They wanted to do this refinance to pay off a $2 million balloon loan that was coming up, and they wanted to get another $400,000 of cash out. The problem was Bill had a 15-month gap in his employment, so it made a full doc loan impossible to do. So we started thinking, we said, well, tell us about the assets. And so here's what we got. They had $737,000 of cash and cash equivalents. So we could use 100% of that. They had 5.1 million of investments. We could use 80% of that. And they had 1.2 million in retirement accounts. We could use 70% of that. So when you add that up, we had $5.6 million of qualifying assets. So we took the 5.6 million, we divided it by 60 months, and it gave us a monthly income of $94,289. Bill and Dana now easily qualified for a $2.5 million loan. Again, for us, we say, please give us 10 more just like it. Here's a few more details on this program. The loan amounts can go up to 75% of the qualifying assets. So what that means is if we've qualified a million dollars, of qual you know, the assets qualify out as a million dollars, we can go up to 75% or $750,000 as a loan amount. We ask that the minimum amount of qualifying assets come to 500,000. On primary residences, we can go up to 80% LTV on purchase and rate and term refinances. We can go up to 70% for cash out refinances. For investment properties and second homes, we can go up to 70% LTV for purchases and rate and term, and we can go up to 65% for cash out refinances. We ask that the borrower have no more than, you know, or, or excuse me, no mortgage delinquencies in the last three years. We do make an exception every so often on that, but that's what we start with and that's what we'd like to see. We're coming towards the end of the presentation, so I just want to tell you a little bit more about what makes Lensure different. 
we've talked about a couple of these things, but the prequels that we do are all done by underwriters and they're done by 24 to 48 hours of the time that we receive it. Once you tell us, yes, this is a good loan, we wanna move forward, we put that in for disclosures and we put it into underwriting and you'll get a fully conditioned underwritten approval within 48 to 72 hours. We make common sense exceptions, just like we've been talking about in this presentation. We have an industry leading bank statement program, which we feel puts us way out there in front of everybody else. We have an aggressive approach to DTI calculations. We went through that on our rental income. I joke about Fannie and Freddie, but I think that approach is very conservative that they use. I don't think we're overly aggressive. I know they might consider us aggressive, but I think it's a common sense approach. And then we have an industry leading asset qualifier program. And then one last thing I wanted to slip in there is we accept transferred appraisals. That's important for many of you who work with a lot of purchase money, uh, real estate agents, and you, you just, that's what your focus is. You're focused on purchase money and you have appraisals that have already been ordered. You started with somebody else and now you don't wanna to have to order a new one. So by transferring the appraisal to us, we can accept it and we can move much quicker through the process. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and let Rose tell you a little bit more about a, a gift that you'll receive for sticking around with us. All right, thank you, uh, Todd. So today, everybody's gonna get an electronic private label resource kit so that all of this, the wonderful information and the tidbits that you've received today, you can um, put them into action and start building your business today once you download this kit. Um, it has banners that you can use on social media, it has uh, flyers, it has got emails, it's got all sorts of stuff that you can personalize. You can put your logo on it, you can put your contact info on it to start generating new business today. So you'll be received, look out for the email after this, um, the thank you email, and there will be a link to the kit uh, in that email. With that, I want to open it up to questions and answers. So go ahead and use your um, use the questions little tool to submit your questions, um, and we will get to as many as we can. I've got a lot of questions about: Can we get a copy of this PPT? Is this being recorded? Are we going to get? Yes, um, the webinar is being recorded, and yes, I will be sending out a link with the uh, slide deck along with the recording and the private label resources. So keep an eye on. Uh, eye out for that in a couple of hours. Todd, I've got a question here from Eric. He goes, and I don't know what it's re in response to, but he, the comment says, yeah, but what about the rate? <laughs> so do you want to talk about our rates a little bit? <laughs> well, I love talking about our rates. We've got the, we feel we're aggressive on our programs. Of course, the rate depends on the LTV and it depends on the FICO, depends on the type of program. We put our programs into four different groups. We put them in the super prime, we put them in expanded approval, and then we have a, a Lensure expanded investor approval, which is our DSCR loan, and then we have our foreign national program. But we got rates that are, you know, in the low fours on up into the six, 7% range. So it, it can vary, but we're very aggressive on our rates. And they can buy those down, can't they? They can buy them down. Okay, great. And um, what do you require for the prequal? Well, we ask you to send as much information as you have. So in most cases, you didn't start out thinking of Lensure for the loan. It fell out from some other place. It fell out in your conforming source. So in most cases, you have pretty much a full package. So we ask you to send everything to us. And in many cases, when that happens, the prequel that you get is actually a soft underwrite. They're being underwritten by underwriters. So you know, for all intent and purposes, you're getting a full underwrite. It's not until you give us the go ahead that we then stick it into underwriting and get you that fully conditioned approval and get the disclosures going. But it allows us to move real quick and allows us to get you a quick prequel answer with a rate and the income that we're using within 24 to 48 hours. Okay. On an investment purchase, do you go off of actual rents on the property or do you allow slash use rental <clears throat> survey from the appraisal? Hi, Rose. 
Um, I've been sitting here quietly listening to Todd. This is Steve Mola from the Director of Underwriting for Credited, or for Lyncher, sorry. And uh, I can answer that one. So there's two ways we look at that. If your current rents are higher than what you see on the 216 or the 1007, if you can provide the lease agreement and two months cancel check showing receipt of higher rents than are in the market, we will accept those as part of our calculations on full dock as well as the debt service coverage ratio program, which is our DSCR. Okay. Uh, where can we find the rate sheet? I would tell you that the best move is to contact us here at, at Lensure, or if you have an account executive that you know that you're already working with, contact your account executive because we change our rate sheets from time to time. So we don't post them on our website anymore. So you'd want to reach out directly to us. And if you're not sure who your account executive is, go ahead and reply back to the email, that um, the thank you email, and um, that's going to come to me, and I'll make sure to hook you up with um, your uh, Lensure account executive. So can we lend in Hawaii? We can for business purpose loans, and that's it at this point. We're looking to get licensed there. Okay. Um, how about a borrow with a tax lien with installment payment agreement put in place with the IRS? Hi, this is Steve again. Obviously, uh, when we have tax liens, we always have a few questions in underwriting, especially for doing bank statements. Want to have an understanding of why there was a tax lien in place. Uh, if you have a written agreement and you've made payments on it, even if it's a newer one, uh, we won't look to make that being paid off as part of our decision. Obviously, if it's recorded on title and we're doing a refinance, we're going to have to address it at that point. But as a general rule, tax liens under repayment uh, will simply hit them with a payment in the uh, debt ratio, but one will require the tax lien to be paid off. I've got a couple of different questions on um, time to close a loan. What's our typical time to uh, close a loan? We've closed loans as quick as three days on non-owners. We closed owner-occupied loans as quick as eight days. I would say that our typical turn time is closer to 14 to 15 days, uh, but we can move very quickly when we have to. And in some cases, we know we have a close of escrow that is right upon us. And so we're doing everything we can to try and close that thing as, as quick as possible. Do we use mixed? Can we do mixed-use properties? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, this is Steve again. Uh, mixed-use properties, uh, we do do them. We've done quite a few over time. The real question is, is it a mixed-use property from the fact that it's really currently an SFR, but I'm running a dental office out of the front, and I've got a rental in the back. Um, so what we it comes down to basically uh, the type of mixed-use, uh, if we can get a okay with the comp selection, uh, if we can get a rebuild letter that it can rebuild to the current use. Uh, we have done some other ones where it's commercial on the bottom floor and residential on a, the upper floor. You see that in a lot of the inner cities. So we will take a look at those. The, obviously, the most difficult part is getting comp selection. But on the right borrower, yes, we have done those. Okay. And Megan has a two-part question. What, how high do we go on LTVs for the investment properties? And what are the re reserve requirements? You know, I, I know everybody gets hooked up a little bit on the reserve requirements on occasion, but uh, the key on, on for us on that is really if we have an understanding that how the borrower uh, is, is processing payments, payment shock. Um, on in each individual transaction, even though we have certain requirements, I don't want people thinking we get hung up on the reserve requirements just by itself. Uh, normally on non-owners, we're looking at 80 for the max on those. That's our general policy on those. So, uh, once again, if you get a higher quality borrower and we believe they're going to pay, uh, depending on the pricing we can work out, we try to make loans that we believe are going to return our, our uh, the payments to us and that there's good benefit to the borrower. So, uh, we'll take a look at just about anything. Do we need to have broker approval to send loans? No. We will go ahead and allow you to submit a loan to us. We just need to be approved with you by the time it funds. Okay, How? Uh, what's the lowest credit score um, that you work with? Uh, credit score, once again, if we understand the overall transaction of the borrower, what the benefit is and whether we believe they can repay, we've done loans without any credit scores. We still do that. We have those, obviously, under the 
um, I-10 program, and also we have those under foreign national. If you're talking about a normal full doc borrower, uh, rate sheets uh, say all the way down to 500. Uh, we have done a couple below five, but it really depends on what the transaction is and what the borrower looks like. So uh, score scores in itself, a minimum, you could say 500, but we'll look at anything that makes sense. Yeah, the big the big key there is it has to make sense. If there's just a lot of drag and, and problems with payments, then you know credit score doesn't really matter. It's going to be a challenge for us. But if if there's some issues that are making the credit score low and yet the previous rent history or mortgage history is solid, then you know, we try to lean forward. Thomas wants to know if we work with non-licensed brokers. I've actually gotten this question a couple of a couple of times in the last few days. Uh, we have on some instances where they're doing business purpose loans only. Uh, we prefer them to be licensed. It makes the process much easier. But uh, I guess the technical answer is yes, we can do that. Can an owner-occupied loan be considered business purpose? Mm, that's a no on that. Okay. And um, can we get more information on your ITIN uh, program? I know we have a page on our website under Featured Programs. If you look under Loans and Featured Programs, there's some information on there. Um, but if you uh, reply to me, send me an email after the presentation, I'll be happy to connect you with your lender account executive. That's really the best way because they can walk you through the scenarios and talk to you and, and get you any resources and rates and anything else that you need. But we do have an aggressive ITIM program, so I'm glad you're asking and I'm glad you're interested. All right, great. And do we service the loans? Uh, we don't service the loans currently. The transfer occurs at the close, but the servicing company that we use is actually approved by another um, business affiliate that we have. Awesome. All right, I'm going to close it out with one actual comment from Steve. Uh, one of the better presentations I've attended in a, uh, in a while. Great job, and thank you. Thank you, Steve, for joining us. That's very cool. Thank you. Hey, Rose, I wanted to add one other thing, just of a couple uh, scenarios that we had approved. This was within the last week. Uh, we did, when Todd mentioned that we only do up to 10 loans, that's just guidance as well. I currently have on my desk now that's approved. I talked to the underwriter this morning. We have a, a 12 pack of $600,000, 12 $600,000 loans for an investor. Um, so that's 7.2 million to one client. That tells you that we, we are comfortable getting around large uh, volume deals. Uh, we don't have an issue with that. I have another one that I'm looking at. This is from this week where I'm doing a $2 million cash out refinance on a borrower's primary. He's putting that $2 million down on a, and adding 800,000 on a $5.6 million second home. This is a standard full doc borrower who has 584 properties on his tax returns. Once again, that's something we can easily handle. We combine loan amounts $4 million. It's already approved and that approval is actually being working on, worked on today. So um, some other things too, if you have a deal too, we are working on a new bridge program that's potentially coming out, so keep that in mind. Other than that, uh, anything that uh, you believe makes sense on where we got a good benefit and ability to repay from the borrower, send it in. We'll see about getting you an approval. Thank you, Steve. Thanks All right. a lot, guys. All right. Well, with that, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day, everyone.